It is really my privilege and honor to introduce to you Her Royal Highness, Queen Sylvia Naginda, the Nabagareka, the wife of the Kabaka, King of Buganda. Her Royal Highness started the Nabagareka Development Foundation in the year 2000, a vehicle through which she serves the community targeting the children, the youth, and women, and that is there focusing on development. Her Royal Highness, the Queen, has supported the community through health and education and empowerment of programs through these initiatives. Her Royal Highness is accredited to other organizations and institutions, and she's a patron of the Child Fund of Uganda. She's a Goodwill Ambassador of United Nations Population Fund, amongst many others. So it is as we are unable to do the video right now, it is really my honor and privilege if you could please address the gathering. Thank you. Please, can you welcome Her Royal Highness? Thank you very much. Please stand up. And clap, please, clap, clap. Thank you. Lord and Lady Sheikh, Your Excellency Professor Joyce Jikafunda, the High Commission, the Uganda High Commission in UK, Your Excellencies, the Ambassadors and High Commissioners, Dr. Louis Kasekende, Deputy Governor of Bank of Uganda, the Honorable Member of Parliament from Uganda, members of the Diplomatic Corps, esteemed members of the business community, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here with you for the fifth Uganda-UK Convention, Investment Convention, and I bear warm greetings from Sabasa Jakabaka and the people of Buganda. <laughs> on whose behalf I stand here today. Now, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for this splendid arrangement, bringing together people from across uh, all walks of life to discuss investment in Uganda, and for choosing a theme that resonates closely with our hearts. Now, we have all heard and read growth statistics which mean a lot to macroeconomists and scholars, but do not always help us understand whether ordinary people are actually becoming happier and more prosperous. I don't intend to go into the detailed analysis of uh, the gap between the statistics and the perception of the ordinary people. I'm sure that there are several experts here who will be doing that. However, I would like to applaud the organizers for their uh, insight in the fact that growth statistics only give a two-dimensional view of the effects of investment on our society. If growth is to be truly meaningful and sustainable, all of the people must buy into that growth. For growth to be meaningful and sustainable, all people, all people must feel that the growth brings some kind of benefit in form of prosperity to them. When I say all the people, I mean women as well as men, 
across all the strata of society. And this is why I am especially pleased for having been asked to speak to you about the role of Ugandan women in achieving sustainable development. Now, I'd like to approach this topic from the perspective of Buganda Kingdom to make the argument that the marriage of the ancient and modern can both engender and entrench the role of Ugandan women in achieving sustainable development. Now, for the benefit of those few who may not or who are not familiar with our history, Buganda is an ancient kingdom under a king called the Kabaka, located on the northern and northeastern shores of Lake Victoria. Buganda, as we know it today, was established by Sekabaka Chintu upon a foundation of smaller chieftaincies in all around um, or about the 12th century AD. Now, Buganda's location at the source of the Nile caused it to become a destination for European explorers, a focal point of the scramble for Africa in the 19th century. The explorers were followed by Christian missionaries, who in turn were followed by British imperial agents. Now, the British established the Uganda Protectorate around the kernel of Buganda Kingdom. Indeed, the name Uganda was derived from the Swahili pronunciation of the kingdom. Now, upon independence in 1962, Uganda had a federal constitution under which Buganda and other kingdoms formally retained control of some of their affairs. This constitution was violently abrogated in 1966, and the reigning Kabaka, Edward Mutesa II, was exiled, and the kingdom was abolished. Buganda was ruled under a state of emergency by the military, which eventually turned on its civilian masters in 1971 with a coup that brought Idi Amin to power. So Uganda slowly descended into civil war and state failure and thousands of lives were lost. Peace and stability were restored to Buganda and southern part of Uganda in 1986, when the National Resistance Army, led by General Yoweri Museveni, the incumbent president of Uganda, took over power with the backing of the overwhelming majority of the people of Buganda, whose central demand was the restoration of their kingdom. In 1993, we were blessed with the restoration of the kingdom, and my husband, Kabaka Ronald Mwendam Tebi II, was formally installed as the 36th. Kabaka of Buganda. The kingdom was restored as a cultural institution with no administrative or legislative powers. Now the people of Buganda identify with the cultural leadership of Wakabaka, not only as a source of basic identity, but also as a rallying point and personification of their political, social, and economic aspirations. Therefore, despite the fact that the kingdom has no administrative or legislative powers and that cultural leaders are barred from engaging in partisan politics, the institution of the Kabaka wields significant political, social, and economic influence over the six million or so Baganda and by virtue of its geographical position on all of the people of Uganda as well. Now, it goes without saying that since, as, the rest, as in the rest of the world, roughly half of our population is made up of women, the kingdom has a great impact on the lives of women, lives and positions of women. And I'm proud to say that women leadership was and is still recognized in traditional Chiganda culture. Traditionally, a Kabaka reigns with two significant women leaders, the Namasole or Queen Mother, and a female co-heir, the Nalinya, who is a princess, one of the Kabaka's sisters. In antiquity, and to some extent to date, the Namasoles and Nalinyas were powerful women leaders with their own estates and royal courts. The Kabaka was, and still is expected, 
to consult with them on crucial decisions. Now with the advent of Christianity, the first Kabaka to be weighed in church, Daudi Chwada II, bestowed on his wife the title Nabagereka. This title, which I hold today, has taken on the role of mobilizing women to development in the kingdom, a role which is reflected in the root of the name, or Kugereka, meaning to plan or prepare for providence. So it's in this context, or against the back, that background, that I address myself to the issue of the role of women in achieving sustainable development. The kingdom has been and continues to provide for women in leadership roles. These roles have been modified over the years and have provided for cultural acceptance of women participation in several areas of social and economic life. Now, if the growth statistics fail to reflect the reality of ordinary people by not demonstrating how this growth translates into prosperity in their daily lives, then this is especially the case for women. Growth statistics mask the fact that women living in a predominantly patriarchal society are disproportionately represented among the ranks of the poor, the statistics do not show that according to, recent, to a recent survey, as many as 40% of all the women in Uganda are unpaid family workers, mainly in agriculture. It is also worth noting that conventional growth statistics do not adequately reflect the inequality of income between men and women. They do not reflect the glass ceiling that women hit in their careers, especially because they have to take time out to have and raise children. Now these statistics also do not take into account the lost economic output of the thousands of women who die in childbirth every year, or the millions of women who are rendered less economically productive because they are looking after children who suffer from preventable diseases. Lastly, growth statistics conceal the fact that the land tenure system unjustly favors men over women. Now looking at the plight of women in present day Uganda, it is easy to throw one's hand in the air and say that the situation is hopeless. But that is not how the women in Uganda see it. Despite the challenges, women are the heartbeat of agriculture and other economic production. We are strong and resilient, beating the odds to contribute significantly to Uganda's sustainable development. Going forward, it is incumbent on the government and private investors to reward the resilience of Uganda's women by putting women at the center of policy and investment decision making. By this, thank you, by this I mean more than quantitative window dressing. You see, I know we have many women in parliament, we have a number who are ministers and many women in uh, high offices. Quantitative window dressing. What we need is real qualitative assessment of gender sensitivity and gender impacts of all investments in our country. We must commit genuine efforts to make growth translate into equitable and sustainable prosperity for women. The results will be swift if the first thing that is addressed is inequality in pay Women are already, are already working so hard for little or no pay. Just imagine how much harder they would work if they're getting equitably paid. Legitimate and ancient cultural institutions, such as the Kingdom of Uganda, have a role to play 
in promoting women to achieve sustainable development in Uganda. As I already said, kingdoms such as ours have vast and tapped social and economic influence. By enhancing the visibility of women, not just in leadership roles, but also in the tasks of economic production, cultural institutions can bring about the change that unleashes the presently constrained half of the population to production, wealth, and prosperity. Constructive partnerships between cultural institutions on the one hand and government and all private investors can help lower and eventually overcome the barriers that hold women back in the workplace and elsewhere. Together we can work on the barriers to more meaningful economic participation by women, by improving access to maternal health care, by reducing infant and uh, child illnesses and mortality through better access to vaccines and primary health care, by encouraging parents to send their girl children to school and to leave them there, and by positively addressing and redressing the historical disadvantages faced by women in all aspects of economic production by inculcating a new culture of inclusiveness and equality. Government can also partner with legitimate cultural institutions to work towards achieving land tenure reform so as to ensure that women have security of tenure in the land and that they occupy in their own rights and not simply as the daughters, wives, or mothers of a man. That women have the right to buy, inherit, and bequeath registered titled land, and the right to equitably share in matrimonial property on the death of a spouse or upon divorce. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, and at the risk of repeating myself, women play a big but largely under-recognized and unrewarded role in Uganda's development. It is time that our efforts were recognized and duly rewarded. It is incumbent on government and private sectors to ensure that the investment into Uganda equitably benefits men as well as women. Cultural institutions have played and will continue to play a role in bringing about gender equity in development and prosperity. Now, I don't simply make these suggestions or proposals for the sake of making a great um, sounding speech, but as the Nawagerika, I have walked the talk by dedicating my life to making a difference in the lives of the people of Uganda, and especially the children, women, and the youth and vulnerable groups. In 2000, I established the Nawagerika Development Foundation, which works strategically with other philanthropic institutions, with investors and with government to provide support in key areas of need, such as maternal health, community development, education, uh, public health, poverty eradication, culture preservation, and the empowerment of vulnerable and marginalized groups. The foundation, which has positioned itself as a pace setter in leveraging the culture voice for national and regional development, aspires to be a leading culture foundation that uses culture as a development tool in contemporary society. So we believe that the most successful development programs will be those that not only understand the nuances that exist among different cultures, but those that integrate the positive elements within cultural institutions and work with culture leaders as equal partners, recognize positive culture contexts, and culture as a key framework that defines our choices, opportunities, and abilities. Now, some of the initiatives that we have implemented include the bursary scheme for primary school girls uh, and scholarships for secondary school and university female students, the sexual reproductive health advocacy campaigns targeting both men and women, and the support to youth and women income generating projects. 
And of course, our flagship program that's called Itzakate Chanaba Gerika. This is a children's culture program which is founded on the culture values of social responsibility, industriousness, integrity, respect for diversity, and discipline. As a result, children who go through this program, the Itzakate, not only learn their languages or etiquette, personal and spiritual development, but they also acquire leadership business and entrepreneurship skills. And I commit myself to, tie, to continue tirelessly with these efforts because while a lot has been done, there is still much more that needs to be done. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I hope that what you all see and hear during this convention translates into measurable and sustainable prosperity for the children, women, and men of Uganda. I wish you all fruitful deliberations. Thank you very much. <laughs>